Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. And today I have a very special guest. He's a marketing leader, an entrepreneur, founder of ROI Online, which is a HubSpot platinum agency, also the first story brand certified agency, and recently the author of a book called The Golden Toilet, Stop Flushing Your Marketing Budget into Your Website and Build a System That Grows Your Business. Hailing from Austin, Texas, Steve Brown. Now, I hope you're ready to have some laughs and sit back and learn a little bit about marketing because Steve and I are going to really dig into his book, which is hysterical. And Steve's a really funny guy himself. So I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. I hope you laugh out loud. So without further ado, let's just get right into it. I am so happy to be here with Steve Brown, author of The Golden Toilet. Stop flushing your marketing budget into your website and build a system that grows your business. Yes, you heard that right. It's The Golden Toilet. Um, you know, I met Steve very, very recently, and uh, when I heard about his book, aimed at entrepreneurs mainly. Mm-hmm. But being a marketer myself, you know, I love to figure out, you know, get the latest information. It's a, it's a brand new book, and um, I just, I just absorbed it, man. I have to say that I really absorbed it. So, Steve Brown, welcome. It's so good to see you. I'm proud to be here. Thanks for having me, Dan. Yeah, man. Um, Steve runs a firm called ROI Online, an internet marketing agency. And, um, you know, as the author of this book, I, I, I am telling you, I am so surprised that I haven't come across Steve so far. Um, I just want to start off really, uh, actually, just to ask you, just to introduce yourself and just tell us how you got here, Steve. How'd you get to the point where, A, you're running your own agency, um, you're an entrepreneur in your own right, um, and then B, what gave you the idea for this book and how you, you know, how you basically delivered this incredible, this incredible work. And we'll get into this because it's so funny. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, I appreciate your, um, your feedback on the book. And that's uh, fulfilling to hear, right? But I was an employee for a handful of firms over the years. And I always got pigeonholed into sales. I'm, I'm good at it. I'm okay with going and being out there and messing up and being accountable. And I started to notice over time that and that was about the time when, you know, there's this time when cold calls were, mm-hmm. that was what you had to do. But internet was coming online and I would go and, and because I was making my quote or whatever, I'd just take a, the initiative and go and update the websites. Mm-hmm. So back then, they were just basically a little um, interactive brochure, if you will. But what I realized was if you go and knock on 10 doors and you interrupt someone that doesn't know anything about you and you expect them to stop what they're doing, put down their fire hose, take off their fire hat, and sit down and talk to you and be all interested in what you want to sell them to make your quota, that's a hard thing. That's one out of ten. If if you're lucky, right? Mm. And but that was the mindset of what sales is supposed to be. But when I would go and spend a little time on a website, people would go to the website, they look around, and they would fill out a form, and I would get this email with a question, and I would follow up on them. Well, guess what? You close one out of three of those. Yeah. Why? Well, they're interested in what you you have. They're searching for a solution, and they want you to come talk to them about it. So I'm a real fast learner, and maybe it took me three years to kind of <laughs> catch up in a couple of companies. But, but like, um, I ended up working for this web design firm. And now I'm on the other side. It's actually the web design firm that I took two projects to and had been the one that was the customer. And now I'm on the other side and I'm I'm seeing people come in and I'm hearing the same conversation over and over and over that I related to because I was in their their position. <laughs> but the problem was what I had experienced before but I wasn't kind of aware of it was that when you hand it off to the design department it goes into this black hole and you are 
Well, I think they only let you, they have to tie a rope around your leg before they let you go in behind <laughs> that curtain. And there's only one person that, that can approach and ask these design priests or whatever they are back there. And they have no heart for a business. They have no heart for an entrepreneur. And what are they doing? They're designing something to put on their shelf to point to, look what I designed. That resembled some sort of yellow page ad that they had done before. That was frustrating. And these these entrepreneurs would come in and they had the same request and the expectations, but they would look to me to help pull it out of the ditch, but I was powerless. So instead of sitting around and complaining about how that owner was running their business, I decided, you know, if I'm so smart, if I know so much, then I need to put myself out there and start my own agency. And I probably argued with myself maybe six, nine months before I, I did that. And it's scary. Yeah. But that's why I started my agency, ROI Online. When did, when did you start it? How long have you been in biz? Oh, my gosh. That's um, 2012, I believe. It's, it's eight years. It's amazing. You think back to 2012, which just seems to be just yesterday mm -hmm. to, you know, in, in, the, in, the digital, in the digital world, though, yesterday is years. I mean, well, you know, years ago is like decades. Yesterday is years. It's like dog years. Yeah. It's like dog years. <laughs> so 2012 was really, you know, compared to today, compared to the user experience um, that's available today, it's a completely different kettle of fish, as an old boss of mine would say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember um, starting out in this industry, marketing and communications back in the early 2000s, you know, 2004, 2005, and reading David Meerman Scott, you know, the yeah. new rules of marketing PR. And, um, Faded up. Oh, man, it just changed, it changed my life, you know. But, but really what it led to was this whole discussion of putting the customer or, or thinking like the customer ultimately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's, you know he, he, he was one of the guys that was pivotal to the HubSpot, whole, uh, the HubSpot revolution and yeah. inbound marketing. So he turned me on to inbound marketing at that time and, or just that whole connection between him and the, the HubSpot guys. Um, and that changed everything. And you do you, you talk about that in your book actually mm -hmm. quite a bit, um, being a HubSpot agency as you guys are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even in 2012, right? Yeah. The, the user experience, we still weren't there. I mean, the book was written, what, 2004, 2005? Um, maybe before that. Mm. Um, and you'd figure after, you know, whatever, eight, 10 years that, they would have started to get it right, but even in 2012, interruptive marketing was probably still predominant. I think probably in the, the last five years, we've seen such an acceleration of the customer, the buyer, the, the I hate to say user, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the target, the, yeah. the consumer, they've, they've really taken control of the car and you know, kicked us off to the side. If and we're very, very lucky if we even get a backseat. Yeah. So you know, reading your book, it really, it really kind of screamed at me that that's kind of where you're coming from. That's what you're all about. So back in 2012, when you started, when you went out on your own, you were already sort of ahead of the curve a little bit in thinking that you know we were getting it wrong, the customers were getting it right, mm -hmm. but the businesses didn't know how to make that connection. Yeah, and the problem right? was. The problem was, Dan, was they felt it. They felt they needed to approach where the world was going in the future, but they didn't have the words to say exactly. And so we're coming out of this design brochure, and we're just, someone comes in and goes, I think I need to redo my website. That was the best word they had. And I think I need to show up in a search. And so we all, we all say, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Pick me. I can, do, I can do that. So they're coming in with, they already filled out their prescriptions. Right? They, yep. they come in with a prescription and they're asking you, the, the doctor or whatever, will you fill this prescription? And everybody goes, yeah because they want that job. And then later, when the customer is mad, 
because it didn't, I don't know, it was a six-month death march, and you have, <laughs> they're mad. They've had to reach over and try to drive to get this thing out of the ditch, and they're just upset. And I realized over time, here we are, we're wanting to make them happy, and, and sincerely, we had changed our the way that we work with them. We were doing all the things, but they didn't understand the things that we were doing. And we thought they did because they said marketing and we're mm -hmm. doing marketing. They said social media and we're doing social media. But, and I talk about it in my book, but it's like I was just blown away why, why they weren't seeing what we were doing was helping. And I just realized that we, even though they said tomato and we said tomato, we weren't seeing the same tomato. We weren't seeing the same fruit or yeah. is it a vegetable? And, Anyway, Either one, right? I put it in there with the rest of the vegetables. But, but are you talking about a mini or a Roma or a flat plump <laughs> jersey? Yeah, I don't know. But it's like <laughs> we were doing all this work, doing what they asked or what we understood they asked us. But it wasn't making a difference like we were hoping. And so my book started to come out of this place that I was realizing – and so, Dan, you've, you've experienced it. You saw, all right, I made that. This customer left, and I'd, we'd done all this work, but I, you're going, all right, if I'm going to be mature about this and not blame them for everything, what is it that I own in this thing? What did we do wrong? And you look at, okay, and we make that adjustment. Next one, we're going to do this that way. But I realized that the real problem wasn't the problem we were addressing. The real problem was we weren't having the same expectations. We weren't saying the same language. We weren't seeing the same thing that we were doing. And so that's where that conversation in my book comes from, is that we assumed all the fundamentals were in place. We assumed you understood the fundamentals and we were all working on sexy chat box, chat bots and all this stuff, yeah. but the fundamentals weren't in place. And that's frustrating when you really want to help them and they, they trust you and they, they want it, but they walk away. It's like that conversation you maybe you had with your spouse. And they walk in and you're like all proud and you, you got these tickets to Disneyland, right? <laughs> okay, baby, we're going to Disneyland. And she says, what? We're going, we're, we're going to Disneyland. And she goes, why are we going to Disneyland? And didn't you say... Isn't that what you, you we talked about? And she goes, no. I said Disney World. Oh. And it's like, oh, man. Man. And both of you are disappointed. But there wasn't this lack of intent. But there was this lack of communication. Yeah. And it, it, it seems that we're still not there, clearly. <laughs> you know, I mean, with the expectations of what we magical marketers do. <laughs> Uh, and, and what gets ended up, what, what ends up closing the deal at the end of the funnel, mm -hmm. you know, where, what we do, what the parts of that whole thing, what, how does it add up? Like what, what is the thing that the communicators are doing? What is the thing that the marketers are doing? What's the thing that the, you know, that the, um, the, the, the digital people are doing, the designers, how does that, and the brand people, I mean, let's throw some more kind of right. spices into that nice soup. And you know what is the thing that all these people do? The customer, or in my case, I work inside. You know, I'm a client side guy. So you know, in my case, the senior management or whoever's paying the bills, whoever is the owns the budgets uh, beyond my budget. You know, they just are like, okay, you said that you're going to get some leads. Well, how come I don't have any sales? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this is one of the things I think is really like. It, somewhat illuminating, but absolutely accessible and, and relevant and so well done in your book is you make this connection between that, what are the marketers doing? What are the salespeople doing? Why is there a disconnect there? Mm -hmm. And you know, the reason is, well, there's a lot of reasons, but you have to think, first of all, get, the, get on the same page in terms of the definitions. Mm-hmm. 
right? This is what you said about managing expectations. Right. right? You know, have the same, ex- Disney World versus Disneyland. <laughs> marketing lead, marketing qualified lead versus sales qualified lead. Very different things. You know, marketers are getting all these names and handing them off and then they disappear, mm-hmm. right? Why am I not making any money on this? Well, <laughs> you know, um, I lo- hope maybe we'll get into some things she said in the book because I love some of the analogies you use, <laughs> like the, uh, the cattle herding one is fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, let's just t- say that one right now. Yeah. You got some cowboys, yeah. right? Saying, huh, you know, there's some cattle. Let's go rustle the cattle. Yeah. And they rustle the cow, they herd them, but they got no pen to put them in, <laughs> right? They got no pen, they got no farm, nothing. They're just kind of running around with these cattle. Yeah. And eventually they're like, this is a bad idea about <laughs> rustling cattle. We got all this cattle, we got nothing to do, it's a bad idea. Yeah. So, you know, to really very poorly summarize, you know, Steve's point, but the, the it was, it, I was so funny, I was laughing about all these things, <laughs> by the way. But that's what it's like, right? So instead of thinking about the marketers going out and getting the marketing leads and then being done with it, or the salespeople trying to make their sales, the trick is, or the, the important part is to think in terms of a system. Instead of thinking right. piece by piece, it's systems thinking. Mm-hmm. And that, it's right in the title of your book, Build a System That Grows Your Business. Um, that fascinates me, systems thinking. And why is it that marketers, why is it that marketers and entrepreneurs and executives don't really have a clue of what this is? Why is it that that's the case, you think? Marketing's always been the the redheaded stepchild that's dismissed from the dinner table when the conversation gets serious. They're cute, they're ditzy, they're fun, okay, but they're it's not. Uh, the problem is that everything's been industrialized, mm-hmm. okay. So since World War. Two, everybody came out and it was like, okay, just sit at your desk and do what I tell you. And so sales, you've got a quota, you go out and do so many cold calls. And then, but there's an annoying marketing person keeps trying to insert them. They want to do something fun and cute, but that's not real business. That's not, okay. But now it's like marketing and and management, it's chief marketing officer becoming chief sales or business development. All these things merging because of the technology and the data that's being revealed from from the visits, from the clicks, from all this data that started to be dumped on here. All of a sudden, marketing's becoming legitimate, and so. Some organizations are laggardly, is that a word? <laughs> but they're, they're slow to change their concept and expectations of the marketing person. Mm-hmm. Enterprise accounts, yeah, that's, we're down the road, but people that you know, have 20 or less employees, they're just now starting to look up and go, oh my gosh, we need to get our act together online. I can't go shake hands anymore. I can't go have lunch with my, you know, I can't do that. I need to be legitimate and and relevant virtually. And so all of a sudden now that's being embraced. Well, but marketing, the problem with the disconnect between marketing and sales is a lack of an overall strategy about what we're really wanting to accomplish. And if they could, and I talk about it in my book, but but like if you think about a professional golfer, mm-hmm. one day I was watching um, a golfing tournament, and it just hit me that first of all I was going, well, why does that guy get a caddy all the time? Because that'd make my job easier. At least at least I wouldn't hit 120. I might be hitting 112 or something right at the end of the game if I just had this guy coaching me a little bit. But that's like your sales guy has to has to put the ball in a hole. They got to play that hole. They, they're they held accountable and and they have to take the swings. But marketing's like the caddy. Caddy's sitting there and going, all right, the wind is doing this and I'm looking at my stuff. I walk the course. and So you need uh, you need this club and 
this will get, increase your chances of success. And they work together. So I just like, oh, that's marketing and sales. Mm-hmm. They should be working together and strategizing the whole. But then branding is like, well, who's the audience that follows that particular golfer, how they dress, what kind of watch they wear, you mm-hmm. know, that. So yep. different audiences follow different. And so branding is just how people feel after interacting with you. Mm-hmm. And then positioning would be like, well, what are the tournaments that we really have an increased percentage of uh, opportunity to to bank, to make some money in this, to place or whatever? And so that's simply, that's how a business should look at this. Not a website, but they should look at it as a system because they're bringing opportunities into this organization. So mm-hmm. then they need to be coordinated, strategic, and and. And that was the struggle with communication to the entrepreneurs that come in and they go, well, we need to redo our website. But knowing they need to first, we need to get your messaging super clear and succinct. Mm -hmm. But then we need to put it into, bake it into some technology that's going to facilitate. We need to, we need to subordinate the robots to serve us instead of go out and try to please the robots. Okay. And then, then let's do strategic campaigns. Now it's time to talk about what's our Facebook ads? What's our, you know, what are we going to do to promote stuff? Because you go place an ad and you expect someone to come to your website and dig around for 30 minutes. You, you don't have a lot of time. <laughs> They're barely going to give you three seconds. So you need to send them to a very specific place where they find exactly what they were expecting and know what to do next. So the website mm-hmm. is part of the system. Yeah. In fact, sometimes not even necessary. Right. right? I mean, you know that. I know that. I, I would never be able to convince my my, my leadership of, of some of these things. By the <laughs> way, um, but you know how to how to look at a website as more than just a brochure, mm-hmm. right? But less than the totality of the experience. Um. Is, is a challenge that we sometimes face, you know? And sometimes the solution we get is, oh, build more websites, right? you know? Okay, well, we have this website. Let's build another website that's really focused on content only. Mm-hmm. Well, essentially what you're doing is you're creating a series of landing pages that are, you know, mostly top of the funnel, but, but okay, fine, we'll build another, we'll, we'll build you three websites. We'll, we'll have a content website, we'll have a, a, a corporate website, we'll have a product website, right? Mm-hmm. But you can do this ad infinitum. <laughs> But if you don't have, if you don't, if you're not able to facilitate the journey, you know, of our customers through that process, you know, because a vast majority of them are not going to care about what's on your website, right? They mm-hmm. already know you. What do they need to? What do they need to come to your website for? You even said that in the book. You don't need a website, Mm-mm. right? Um, and uh, by the way, um, let's let's divert a little bit and talk a little bit about SEO because. <laughs> Because I have to admit, you kind of won my heart at the opening sections of your book where you start to talk about SEO. I had a, I had a, a conversation very recently, a rec- an open recorded one with my cousin, uh, Steve. It was one of my podcast episodes where mm-hmm. he's a lawyer in Florida, you know, and, he's, and he runs a, a personal injury uh, firm, right. right? He and his partner have been running this firm for 30 years. And um, they were on top of things when the internet was new, mm-hmm. right? Now they're not so much on top of things from a digital standpoint. They still do great business because they are, you know, have been they have a great reputation, word of mouth, all that kind of stuff. But if they want to survive past the next, you know, several years, if they want to get have the firm exist after they retire, they need, you know, some exi- they need some better, you know, kind of marketing infrastructure going on. And anyway, we were talking about this and he it just came to pass that he's, you know, there are agencies and people trying to sell him on, you know, getting seen in the search engines. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I saw an article by, um, by Mark Schaefer said, um, why are you doing SEO? <laughs> you, have, you have essentially no chance, is the point, right? If, unless you are a massive multi-billion dollar, you know, organization with so much money, right, right to spend on ads, that's one thing. But to build so much content that you basically dwarf everybody else, or if you've been around for 30 years on the web, since the web began, you've had a website for that long, your authority and your longevity are going to push you up anyway, right? Right. Um, 
so for the small, medium, the very small companies, what's the point, right? Don't even go there. So when you start to talk about SEO, it's like, would you say, if you don't think Google knows what your, what your website is about, right? It's like, you got nothing thing coming. How can you not think that Google doesn't know what your website is about? <laughs> that, I, you know, and I hadn't ever really heard it put that way. It's like, why are you trying to entertain all these robots and algorithms yeah. when the fact of the matter is, if they can make these robots and algorithms, do you think they don't know what your website's about? Right. So, you know, anyway, that really spoke to me. And I think a lot of people need to hear that. So what, what are your thoughts about how SEO fits into the whole thing Yeah. in, in general? And, you know, should people be pursuing that at all? The problem is that you're a business owner and you get called every single day. That is if you answer the phone. And you get all these people that are just saying, I can get you to the top of a search. You know, this really sunk into me. So I found myself divorced for the second time. Hmm. And I had to, um, had to embrace that I needed to go to online marketing. <laughs> so I go and I'm setting up a profile on one of the platforms, right? And what do they ask you? They ask you all the SEO stuff. How old are you? Where are you? You know, what's your location? What's your weight, height? These are all search. These are hashtags to show up in a search, right? So they're, they're, and so I'm going, okay, so these are the search engine terms. So you put them all in there. Why? Well, someone on the other end is going, you know, I'm looking for a loser that's younger than this and not over this weight and whatever. And then they go, okay, put some pictures on and write a little bit about you. So I do. I'm a guy. So I put some, yeah. I put, you know, what am I going to do? I, I like pina coladas and walking in the rain. <laughs> and I put, I just grab some pictures, right? And mm -hmm. they're pictures I like. <clears throat> so I'm not really getting hit up very much. And I don't know, maybe six weeks later, my ex pings me and says, Steve, you got to change your pictures on there and you need to change some of your description. And she sends me the pictures that I should put on there. <laughs> and it just hit me how, that... <laughs> how kind of her. Right? Yeah, exactly. Think about how bad she must have felt for my, my <laughs> anemic <laughs> representation. Anyway, I, I just hit me that here... You have all these websites that are filling out all the SEO terms, but when people land on it, they're swiping left because it's not connecting with them. Mm -hmm. They're not robots. They're humans. Yeah. They're not faceless, nameless consumers with credit cards. There are people with dreams and, and kids and problems. And you think of all these websites. So what? So what? You happen to hire the savant mm -hmm. that happens to live around the corner from you and knows more than all the army of data scientists, algorithm bending people that Google has found and hired. You just happen to find the one with the lightsaber in the corner and, and he knows how to trick the algorithms to put your ugly website in front of people so they can go to the next one. There, and we do it all the time. We go to yeah. websites and we look around and what are we? We're disgusted and we walk away without any mercy and go to the other, your customer, maybe they're around the corner. I mean, not your customer, your competitor around the corner. And maybe they're not as good as you. But what they do? They put good pictures on there without the, the zip off fishing <laughs> pants, right? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> right? And, yeah. the, and they're, they're actually designing something that connects with humans instead of worrying about what Google's going to do. Is Google going to put me up today? Maybe today Google. That reminds me of that movie, <laughs> The Jerk. Yep. Where he's like, I'm, I made it in the phone book. It's, that's what people are going like. I made it to number seven <laughs> position on the search. <laughs> it's useless. It's a... It's a it's a scam, isn't it? I mean, it is. It's sorry, Google. 
Yeah. Google doesn't care they, about you. Let's just say it. Let's just say it. Let's all don't. say it together. They don't Google care. Google doesn't, doesn't care, care about, about you or me. You. Okay. Yeah. But yep. you know who does? Humans. Mm-hmm. And you need, you need to make, so here's the thing. You need to be producing useful stuff that connects with humans. Well, that's harder than hiring some guy that doesn't care about your business that comes and says, I'm going to get you to the top of the search. Well, okay, in three months, six months, seven months, what if they change the rules? Oh, that's okay. We'll, back, you know, we'll get there eventually. All that energy could be put, it in, put into like, let's, let's talk to some customers. Let's, let's see what they really want to do. I mean, that's, that's just hard to do. You have to care. I, I always I always felt that there was something fundamentally wrong, especially in the early days of um, search marketing, mm-hmm. where you know you'd have somebody come in and say, "Look, man, what you need to do is if somebody's looking for dogs, just take the word dogs and put it in white text on your white background four hundred times, yeah, right, mm-hmm. and you'll start to rank, man." Mm-hmm. You know, this is before somebody started calling that black hat, and you know. It didn't take very long for Google to get wise Mm-mm. to that. But, you know, if that was the way to, to win the system, then the system was not good for people, was it? The system no. was only good for the shifty marketer, mm-hmm. you know, or the shifty company. Um, so, you know, hey, good thing that, that Google made the system so unintelligible and undecipherable that the only way to, for sensible people and sensible companies to get, to get anywhere or to attract customers is by doing exactly what you said is, by being good at what you do yeah. and connecting with humans, right? That's, that's like such a huge takeaway. And it, it took so long for a lot of people to figure that out. But um, I'm, I'm really glad you started talking about that because that's another big thing in your book is, you know, this human to human connection that we have to be making. Mm-hmm. And regardless of the systems, or maybe not, sorry, that's actually the wrong thing to say. The systems cannot exist without that human to human connection, which powers the system, but also uh, fills it. So um, you lay out in the book, uh, the business, the um, business growth, uh, stack. growth stack, right? Mm-hmm. The business growth stack. And a- anybody who's in digital marketing will recognize the, the growth stack in, in its forms that Steve presents. But it's, it's very straightforward and, and I highly recommend people who are not, especially people who are not experienced in digital marketing and want to know what that means when people start talking about the growth stack, Mm -hmm. it's really laid out really nicely in the golden toilet. (laughs) And you can even see it in thegoldentoilet.com. That said, um, you spend a very lot of, you you spend a a significant amount of time talking about the core elements of the growth stack. And one of which is messaging. Yes. And messaging is of course, um, you know, the words we use, it's the way we communicate with one another. But fundamentally, it goes back to storytelling. Right. Now, we talked about this in our, in our call a couple weeks ago, and you said something that, always, that stuck with me since then. It's really, really cool. You said, um, you said, storytelling makes you feel safe. Yeah. And it's, it's like people gathering around a fire. Right? Storytelling is that, is that it, it trips that, what you, you said it was, I'm going to get this, hope I get to the brainstem, right? Yeah. You, 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 it trips it kind of feeds right into your core human brainstem mm-hmm. um, and you know, it gives you that sense of safety because you're sitting around a fire just like we have for millennia um, telling stories and handing down our history one to another. So that the DNA of that or the, the kind of legacy of that can now be found in your local advertising uh, you know, copy. But if it's good copy, it can be. Right, right? exactly. Um, but I love that whole idea of storytelling as fundamental because, you know, I fancy myself a little bit of a storyteller, mm-hmm. but, you know, can you just dig into that a little bit? Because I, th- you know, I think that's worth a little exploration here and you have some really interesting thoughts about it and um, your connection with story brand, et cetera. So yeah. Uh, yeah. If you can just, how does that work with the system? Maybe that's a good, way, a good place to start. Well, you think about basically a website or an email or a text or whatever. It's an interface of communication with you, a brain. Someone on the other end had a brain, hopefully, and put that information in and sent it to you, and it's got to go in through a filter. So bottom line, 
we share a brain stem with all the creature, creatures. That, that's how we kind of connect with lobsters. Um, Jordan Peterson kind of has a great chapter in one of his mm-hmm. books that really connected that for me, but my dog or whatever. And the bottom line, the brain stem is like fiber optic communication. It can't process language, mm-hmm. but no decision is made until that brain stem signs off on it. I call it the bodyguard. Mm-hmm. And we're all familiar with the bodyguard. You know, that it's there to protect and keep the VIP safe. So if, if it senses danger, you're out of there. So how many times is, have you been asked? Uh, you probably remember your, like, your, one of your parents said, what in the world were you thinking when you did that? And you're like, no, I don't know. I'm, you weren't thinking, but you yeah. reacted because of the bodyguard. But we were like left without words to describe why we did what we did. Well, that's the bodyguard at play. But here's the thing. The bodyguard is a evaluating in every situation. In this conversation, your bodyguard is going, you're safe here with Steve, let's spend a little more time. Okay, and we're connecting just like around a campfire or whatever, but but you have to honor the way that your brain, our brains desire to be, receive information and consume information. Our world has changed, but our brains have remained the same, meaning that this concept will always be in play. It was in play 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. It'll be the same thing going forward. And so our brains want to quickly understand something, know we're safe, and that we're, we're respected or understood is the, is the word I usually use. So your, the text that you use on your website needs to really convey that. And so what does that mean? It means you got to be able to have empathy and put yourself in their place and understand what it is that they're wanting to solve. And here's what's wrong with marketing is that all marketing, and we talked about it a little earlier about the real problem is not the obvious problem. The obvious problem is my toilet stopped up. I need to get it unclogged and the floor cleaned up because I got three kids running around. I don't want them to step in it. And and I'm trying to get them fed and out the door, but meanwhile, I got this disaster going on, right? And so a plumber that comes up and says, well, we unclog stops and we use this tool and it's, uh, you know, environment. Mom doesn't care. Mom wants to know that while she's taking care of the kids like she planned on when she got up, that you're in there handling the deal without any, like, a bunch of extra questions and you're going to clean up the mess and it's going to work and you're going to wear your, your booties or whatever, and go out, and then what's mom going to do? Brag about you. Because you came in and advocated for her, not worrying about your, you know, 10% less, or I, I don't know, or maybe this is, you need to buy our service plan on top of this. That doesn't feel safe. It feels like it just, you don't want to get me. You don't get me. So what an opportunity. It's such a low bar. What an opportunity to, like, tighten up your messaging to go, hey, I understand you. I know you got these things going on, but more in, inside, mom's going, I, f- I feel insecure about who I'm going to pick for this because I'm concerned they're going to try to rip me off or sell, upsell me, or, or do I need to stand around and make sure they don't, whatever. Yeah. How nice to convey that, mom, you go handle that. I got this. We'll clean it up, and it's only going to be this, and we're out of here. Well, that feels right. That feels like your dad came over and did it or or your brother who's looking out for you. How easy to design your marketing to feel that way instead of worry about how many words can I stuff into this to get Google to put me up first to trick the next yeah. mom. Well, exactly. And people are not going to be looking for that on Google. You know? No. I mean, you might look for up. If, if you're just on Google and go, Plumbers near me, mm. you know. Then you don't have much of a need, and it's a commodity deal and whatever. Right. You know. Then it's best. Then it's best price wins most likely. But if um, you know, if you're a subscriber to one of those home uh, um, home improvement groups, Angie's List or what have you, mm-hmm. or home you know Home Advisor, and you want to choose or select someone that you want to come and in, invite into your home to fix something. What are you going to do? You're going to read what they say about what, what's what's said about them, what what they say about themselves, you know, 
it's not I have a fancy truck and I and I use the latest uh, po- polymer in my uh, mm-hmm. plungers. It's <laughs> it's you know rest assured that the job is going to get done in a very quick amount of time. You know, it's no no fuss, no muss, whatever you know, whatever it is that um, that the ratings you know kind of stress about that particular person. You know? I th- I think yeah. that that mom might have actually read something about some other mom bragging on a good experience, put it away, forgot about it, mm-hmm. and then when she was like, oh, Sally said something about that, and Ping Sally, she goes, oh, you're going to love this guy. Boom. Yeah. That's, but that's the real marketing, right? Well, it's interesting because you've just taken the marketer out of the mix. Yeah. Right? Completely. And um, we see that all the time. Now, um, Mark Schaefer just wrote a book last year called The Mar- Marketing Rebellion. Um, and there's there's other, other books and messages to this effect, which is that the customer is in charge. And if the customer is in charge, that's what, what you just described is exactly what happens. You know, the marketer, the company, not involved in that conversation. Mm-hmm. This happens in places that are not Google. It mm-hmm. happens in your local Facebook group. It happens in, in, on Instagram. It happens, you know, on a local, on uh, nextdoor.com. It happens places where Google has no reach and where they say, hey, my kids are going to be out of the house for three hours today. I need to get the floor repaired. Do you know somebody who can help me in a hurry? 45 people will say, Seriously? call this person, call that person, call this person, this person. And you have a conversation between people, between the real customers who are, you know, telling their own story about why this is the right plumber to choose. The right, and plumbers don't fix the floors, sorry, the right contractor to choose. Right. A mix in metaphors a little bit, pardon me. <laughs> um, but it is, um, it's incredible how out of the loop, uh, you know, marketing people are. And yet, um, we have a duty to tell our story and we have, we have our companies need to be telling a story in the, it's, because I mean that story's got to start somewhere and it has to, you know, it's not just about selling the plumbing services. It's about whatever it is that your company does, um, whether it's a service or or a product. Uh, at some point, you have to have you have to be in front of a customer as you as the cost as the company as the brand, um, and tell that story. So what I what I want to share right now is like th- this hit me one day. We were working with the marketing director and we we're doing all this good stuff. And But what I was, where we were falling down wa- was we weren't giving her the material that she needed to go and deliver a report on the status. She was doing it. We're a marketing agency. We could have had her set up with killer report. But we didn't think about it. So she's out there doing the best she can. What if she didn't do a good job? So that plumber, that contractor, whatever, why not set your customers up for success to represent you later and brag about you? Well, there's a great marketing opportunity right there. Leave the materials. Teach them how to do it. Make a nice way for them to write a review. That's really that's a really insightful marketing Mm-hmm. That most people do. They just show up and do a good job. Yeah. But that's expected. Mm-hmm. How cool to set me up to go, I'm going to promote you and maybe I'll get them. I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to promote you for free. Yeah. There's so many ways that we can help our customers and we can help um, their customers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just back to storytelling though, I mean, you, you talk about the story brand framework. Yeah. And there's many uh, methodologies for storytelling, and they're f- by and large based on the hero's journey. I, I do love Donald Miller's podcast, by the way, the mm-hmm. Story Brand. Po- it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I admit that I haven't read the book, so it's now on my list. <laughs> it's one thing about doing these podcasts; I get it. My reading list keeps expanding. Yeah, me too. Um, I love it, but um, but I have no. I'm, I'm looking right now at a book on my on my. On my shelf called uh, Brand Bewitchery by uh, Park Howell. Park mm-hmm. Howell's another um, amazing storyteller um, and storytelling, you know, expert. 
but what always gets me is this like the fun, the, the the hero's journey the most kind of classic story and storyline in humanity probably seems to work all the time all the time yeah. so what's the problem with marketing is marketing presents companies present present themselves as the hero of the story but when we go watch a movie we relate with the hero and so really it's we don't care about someone else being the hero it's our journey and we're the hero so when you position your company as the support to the hero the guide is what story brand calls it mm-hmm. then then you're like going all right i have empathy for you and so dan you need to do a good podcast that you're the folks that listen to really appreciate you introducing us to someone else so so you're the hero in this deal but i need to show up and really bring support you and what you really want to create very helpful educational content so if i'm being a good guy then i'm gonna show up and do my best to to help you be the hero, to help yep. people like go, oh, I like listening to what, what Dan brings. So same thing in your marketing is that, all right, if I put myself in your shoes, again, we're back to the, we just talk about mom and the plumber. Mm-hmm. If the plumber goes, I'm not the hero, the mom is, because what's she trying to do? She's trying to take care of her kids. That, that's more important to her. She just needs a house that's clean and safe and operational and kids can go whatever. And so I'm going to go in there and remove those obstacles and get out. And mom continues to be successful. And so to be able to design your materials, again, to make me feel understood, it makes me feel safe. And not like, what have I got to watch out here? Mm-hmm. So here's the hero coming in, what they've got an agenda much different in my agenda, that is that is uh, frustrating. Yeah. But most marketing set up that way. So mm-hmm. the story brand framework just is a beautiful seven-part framework that you can go through. And you're going to go, all right, what's the transformation that the hero is going to make from a messy, insecure, oh, no, another fire I have to put out to happy, thankful, that was less painful than I thought. I got to focus on the kids. Then how to go, all right, I understand what you need. I know that you're probably concerned about if I'm going to respect you and want to like upsell you. So let's resolve that somewhere in that as well. And so we'll just, let's confront it. Let's go, look, I'm going to come in. We're going to get that clean. We're going to get out of there and you can take care of the kids. All right, great. I don't have to look over my shoulder and see what, what you're going to hit me with next. Yeah. And anybody can really... Uh, Find out about the story brand framework. Um, basically, you can Google it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> as much as we say Google's not going to help you, Google could help you in this case. In this case, but yeah. um, but you could just go to ROIonline.com um, and and learn from Steve's firm about the story brand framework uh, yeah. if you really want to. They got um, a great book, Building a Story Brand. You can read it. Uh, Building a Story Brand by Donald yeah. Miller. And I brag um, about it in my book as well. So yeah, the, just the idea of storytelling as a powerful tool and. You know what I lo- what I also love about storytelling is that it elevates the kind of top of the funnel what has formerly been kind of looked at as a second second fiddle to marketing um, group of people in the company the the communicators. Mm-hmm. Um, I think over time the you know communi- communications and marketing this is a common thing I've said again and again in my podcast with other people but you know communications and marketing are their line has blurred. There's no longer, you know, if your company has an old school PR department that's only doing press releases, your company's in serious trouble. Serious. Um, you know, so I, and now culturally, there are reasons why that happens in some companies in some countries. I get that. But I mean, just normal. If, if you're a, especially if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're like, I need PR and you just decide I want press releases, you need to do more thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, you know, right now, the, the, the nature of building relationships with our customers is really uh, done much, uh, has been traditionally done more skillfully with people who have a skill set in building reputation and relationships. Right? Right. So, so you want to have storytellers and communicators, brand journalists, all these different people on, on board. Um, and that could be one person, you know, but depending on the size of your company. But uh, you want that, um, that kind of approach these days. Uh, but anyway, I really that's I do like that about storytelling is it brings um, you know a whole new 
um, discipline into direct influence on business strategy. Right? It's, everyone in your organization has sat down and read a story and they accept it and it feels right. And that's why that's so impactful. And I'm so glad that you talk about it so much in your book. Look, your book is, is, is so funny. Everybody's got to read this book. Um, anybody in marketing, whether you, like I said earlier, whether you are a novice or an experienced marketer, um, the, the golden toilet is <laughs> the, the golden toilet is is absolutely. Um, it's first of all, it's hysterical. If you have experience with this stuff, you will be you'll just be nodding your head yes. Um, there's some great quips in here. I had to, I have to I have to share one that maybe explains your earlier comment about your second divorce, but I'll, I'll explain it <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, where you're talking about storytelling, you say, now, now, now you see our hero coming in, come into some new knowledge or insight in the form of a helper, like a book or a donkey, or maybe a wizard. Never a spouse. <laughs> Men can, man can take advice from strangers all day long without hesitation, but to take advice from a spouse is just not believable in any story. <laughs> <laughs> Now, my wife will listen to this podcast, and I will tell her, and I'm going to say this right now for everybody to hear, I always take your advice, honey. <laughs> this is hysterical. This is so good. That's just one example um, in here. I, 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 I even marked a quote where you, it's a quote of a quote. I mean, you, you pull in George Bernard Shaw into mm-hmm. here with, you know, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Yeah, the growth mindset. It's um, there's so much good stuff in here. I am so pleased to have read it and to have met you uh, to inspire me to read it. And everybody should go to Amazon right away and look up the Golden Toilet by Steve Brown. Now, before we wrap this up, Steve, um, I'm going to do something you had mentioned to me. I'm going to say to you the following words: Is there a question? that I haven't asked that you'd like to answer? Yeah. Uh, Daniel, I can't believe you asked me that. That's, <laughs> that's such a hard question. A great question. No, the, that, by the way. here's the thing. The reason I named it the golden toilet is because it's the most universally absurd icon of wasted money. And every, uh, my book is written to the heroes, who I call the invisible heroes of the... American economy and other economies, but they're the ones that risk everything. They have 20 or less employees. They have to wear all these different hats, and yet they have to navigate this gauntlet. So I wanted to give them the words, the images, the expectations so that they could align and get through this. But don't see a website, see a system. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't see consumers, see humans. And... um, there's a little story in there about the tiger. This tiger's walking through the forest. He's uh, hungry and looking for a kill and comes upon a flock of sheep and he's about to go for that sheep and he realizes there's a little tiger coming. What those sheep? What? What? So he walks up to the, the tiger coming. He goes, well, what are you doing here, guy? You, you're a tiger like me. What are you hanging out with these guys? And he's sitting there chewing grass and the little tiger cub says, bad. And he's just like blown away. He says, no, you're, you're a tiger like me. You need to be eating meat, not grass. And the little tiger cub says, bah. So he grabs him, takes him down to the creek and shows him his reflection. says, look, you look just like me. And the little tiger, again, he says, bah. So he runs and completes his hunt and brings back some meat. The tiger cub's never, never eaten meat. And he finally has to force it on that little tiger cub because he kept refusing and refusing. So he swallows some of that meat and he just feels this energy come into him and out comes this little bitty tiger cub roar. And he's it's like, wow. But what that meat represents is the truth that entrepreneurs, we and this is not derogatory, but we live and eat and and commune with the sheep, and we forget that we're tigers. And the truth is, you're you're a tiger, and you stepped up to be that unreasonable man to make a difference. To you're the one, the reason why they have jobs. You're putting everything on the line. So eat your tiger food. Be a tiger. That is amazing. I love that story. Great advice. Great book. 
Steve Brown, ROIOnline.com, also thegoldentoilet.com to be really the, for the for the website that's really focused on the book. Um, you'll find all kinds of resources there. Um, there's actually an audio version of the book there, uh, but go to Amazon and buy it because it's it should be on your it should be on your on your um, on your bookshelf. Uh, Steve, this has been one. It's been so much fun. You're a fun guy. I mean, you're, you're hysterical. The <laughs> book is hysterical and very educational at the same time. Um, it's been a pleasure. You're a great host. This has been so much fun. I really enjoyed it. I love talking about my book from someone who read it. And Yay. that's just the best thing. Thanks so much, Dan, for having me. You got it, man. If you enjoyed this episode of The Dan Nessel Show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.